Thank you for being here. We'll get started in just a minute. I'll go through my introductory spiel and then I'll hand it off to the wonderful Nina Versace. Um, hello everyone and welcome to this presentation, Indigenous Communities at the Confluence through the Roberson Museum and Science Center. Throughout this presentation, I welcome everyone to type questions in the uh, chat, which you can find a button down below if you're on desktop. Uh, and I believe you should find a button somewhere over here, depending on where I'm pointing um, on your mobile device. Um, and we can answer those questions towards the end. Um, and I know many of us might be coming from all over, maybe not the Binghamton or Broome County area. So I wanna give you a sense of where the Roberson Museum is located. Um, it's located at the confluence, which relates to the, the title of two major rivers, the Susquehanna and the Shenango. It's uh, the ancestral land of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and more specifically the Onondaga Nation who we recognize as the past, present, and future stewards of this land. And we are honored to display the contributions uh, this wonderful nation and its people have made and continue to make to art, history, and science through some of our exhibitions that are currently up uh, at the Roberson Museum. Uh, and I realize with Zoom events like these, we may not, um, again, be all be coming from the same place. So maybe you, um, the nation that uh, you're that you're standing on, or the land that you're occupying, might be different. So I will be sure to drop a link in the chat um, so that you can explore uh, whose native ancestral land you might be residing on. Um, we are committed to growing and understanding this land and what it means to be here and what it means for the Roberson to be sitting here through perspectives that are new to us um, or we may not be aware of. So we're excited to have Dr. Nina Versace uh, to share her research and perspective today. Uh, she received her doctorate and master's degree in anthropo anthropology from, excuse me, Binghamton University and her bachelor's degree in anthropology from Rutgers University in New Jersey. She has been active in professional archaeology since 1972. In 2019, she retired as director of the public archaeology facility, a research center on the Binghamton University campus. She continues to be a part of uh, PAF's research, education, and community outreach missions. She's currently assisting with the National Science Foundation informal STEM grant at the Windsor and Whitney Point Middle Schools. Her entire professional career has centered on researching the archaeological history of the people who once lived in present day New York State. And with that, I'll hand it off to you, Nina. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Well, thank you, Natalie, for inviting me uh, to give this presentation. It's it's been a pleasure and an honor to return to, to Robertson for, for this presentation. I'm going to uh, share a screen with my PowerPoint. And if you just bear with me two seconds, I will get it running. I think everybody can see that. So this evening, I will weave together information from more than a century of archeological studies in the Susquehanna Valley. I will tell a story that covers thousands of years of communities at the confluence prior to the arrival of Europeans, something that we call the pre-contact period. There have been many discoveries around the Susquehanna and Shenango confluence that are of national importance as well as regional significance. In other words, our local history is part of a national story of life before European contact. And a lot of people tend to view uh, our archeological discoveries in our own backyard as being very local and, and specific to our region. But I'm hoping to show during this presentation that a lot of the discoveries that have been made here over the years really do have national significance. And in some ways, uh, this, this region, the Southern Tier, especially near the confluence, has been on the cutting edge of archeological discovery. I hope uh, you'll find this story as exciting as I do. 
And as Natalie has, has said, I've spent my whole career mostly in the Susquehanna and Shenango Valleys in the Southern tier of New York. And I, I'm always surprised and delighted to learn new knowledge about the archeological history. First, uh, I'd like to make a distinction between indigenous and archeological history. Indigenous history is based on the oral traditions and oral history of people such as the Haudenosaunee, uh, also known as the Iroquois, and the Leni Lenape, the Delaware, on whose land we now live. They continue to have great interest and, and in their traditional territories, and they transfer this knowledge to each new generation. So the stories are, are ancient, they're from their ancestors and their ancestors' ancestors, and they continue to pass that information down, not only to generations of, of indigenous youth, but also they, they kindly share much of that knowledge with those of us who have an interest in learning another dimension to the archeology span that we perform. Their history, just to get us started, tells the story of how the first peoples came to be on this earth. They tell of how a pregnant woman who lived in sky world above the clouds that we see today fell through a hole in the sky and landed on turtle's back. A sky woman represents the mother of indigenous peoples and the start of their history, creating families and communities on the ever expanding back of turtle. Their history is in terms of the oral traditions creates a broad, a broad history of themes that are recognized and, and taught throughout. In contrast, archeological history is based on excavations, analysis, and documentary research. Sometimes this research is conducted with consultations, collaborations, and even consent of indigenous people. The archeological history tells the stories of everyday life of past communities in, in such detail as within specific villages or communities, and even sometimes households. I often work with indigenous peoples, particularly from the Onondaga, Oneida, and Delaware Lenny Lenape nations. And I've benefited from, from many of our conversations. Uh, our conversations have promoted respectful excavations and stewardship of the land that they and their ancestors call home. So today I, I will focus on two time periods uh, as defined by archeologists, the, the archaic period, a, a time when people were very mobile. They, were, they moved when, when the seasons changed, they moved over large distances. They hunted, they gathered, they fished. And as we'll, we'll hear in some of, of this discussion tonight, uh, they had a, a much more complex way of life than we'd like to uh, consider based on, on past research and, and uh, publications. And then I'll focus on the late woodland as part of a larger uh, woodland period as defined by archeologists. And it was a more settled time based on agriculture. And to illustrate these, these two time periods, I'll focus on these sites that are here. Uh, most are, are in, in the Susquehanna Valley. Some are in the Shenango Valley. Most are, are pretty close to the confluence. Now, some of this material may be familiar to those of you who have heard me speak before but with other presentations and even in some other publications. But other information I will be presenting for the first time in over 30 years. It's been not hidden, but laying dormant in, in uh, different places. And it's nice to be able to bring, bring that to light after so many decades after their first discoveries. The first uh, time period that I'll talk about is the archaic. And it basically involves small groups of people who traveled over large distances earlier on. They were hunting game, they were fishing, they were collecting plants, and they lived in small communities that moved uh, quite frequently, often as the seasons changed. As they moved, we moved through time uh, around 4,000 to 3,000 BC, 
these groups began to be more uh, territorial and living within specific geographic ranges. And they still moved their camps as the seasons changed. They aggregated, groups would come together for major ceremonies during certain parts of the year. They would break apart into small family groups that uh, foraged widely within the valley territories. Uh, but basically they, they, they were nomadic, seasonally nomadic and covered great amounts of, of distance. They were, their technology was based mostly on stone uh, that pottery had not been created yet, but their technology was supplemented by hide containers, bone and antler tools, woven mats and baskets. Now, some of the materials such as those made of stone have survived thousands of years in our acidic soils, but others such as wooden objects, baskets, mats, they did not survive except on very rare situations and some of those we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. The first site I'll talk about is one right in the backyard of the Robertson Museum. It's called the Robertson site and it was discovered in 1981 when Robertson was planning on expanding their parking lot. Several seasons of excavation were conducted at the Robertson site and it produced artifacts that spanned almost 10,000 years. Very surprising, uh, but, and then again, not so surprising for a site right at the confluence of the two rivers, the Susquehanna and the Shenango. I had the honor of directing the second year of excavations and continuing on with the analysis afterwards. In the uh, mid 1980s, the excavations and analysis were completed and the Robertson Museum received a, a large grant for a major exhibition and a catalog to accompany that exhibition. Both the, the exhibition and the catalog are entitled Hunter to Farmer. I, I wrote the, the, the catalog and I co-curated the, the exhibition. A really interesting site, a pre-contact time capsule with many time periods layered in the backyard of the museum. Now, some of the finds were, were very rare. Some were more common, but many were intriguing discoveries that have changed and altered some of the ways we think about the archaic in, in the Southern tier. And best of all, the site was declared eligible for the National Register of Historic Places and actually listed. I helped write the nomination form and it was listed on the National Register and the Robertson Museum shrunk their plans for parking, created a, a layer of fill that they placed over the site, grassed it over, and they were able to shore up the sides. And today you're able to go and, and enjoy a nice restful sit down and in, on top of the site and enjoy the, the aspects of the river just as the, the indigenous people who lived there once did. As I mentioned, there were some very interesting and rare items that, that came from the site. There are points, uh, archaic, middle and early archaic point styles that are not known for other areas of the Susquehanna Valley that were found at Robertson. Now, I'll, throughout my talk, I will be making reference to projectile points or points for short. And what I mean by that are hunting implements, the tips of hunting implements that were put onto either spears or darts or arrows. Archaeologists just tend to shorten it and talk about points. And so I will be doing the same. But you'll notice from this slide, let me see if I can make this work, that many of these projectile points are broken in a very specific way. So you can imagine if these were on the tip of a spear and they hit an animal and the animal shook the, the spear and hit a tree and it broke off. Or when the, the animal was brought down and brought back to camp, that the, the tip may have broken off as they removed the spear. So we know that they were hunting during these very early time periods from 8,000 to 6,000 BC. And we have an illustration of what a camp might've looked like based on some of the, the tools that we found 
as, as well as some of the, the animal bone that was found. This illustration here is from a catalog, Hunter to Farmer, and it was illustrated by Margot Weissman. Similarly intriguing were two point types found on the site. One is described as, as Lamoca. These stem, small stemmed points are, are somewhat common in the arc, late archaic. They are found on many, many sites. They are not as common here in the southern tier of New York. They're more, more common in other areas, such as the Finger Lakes. But also found were these notched, small notched, corner notched points. And these have been called vestal notched points based on a site at Castle Gardens that I'll be talking about next. What was interesting is that we found some cooking hearths, several of them that dated from radiocarbon dating of, of some of the charcoal on the site from, that, from those pits to about 1900 BC. The layers of the site also produced other types of points such as the ones we see here that documented time periods all the way from 1900 BC to AD 1400, such as these uh, whoops, triangular points here are from the later agricultural period. But these two points, the Vestal and Lamocas, have, have caused archaeologists quite a bit of, of time thinking about what, what they actually signify. And many of the scholars who have studied these, this time period, I'm sorry, I have a very sensitive computer today. They've wondered about the dating of these. So the New York State archaeologist uh, received a, a, an alert from many local amateur archaeologists, and they were worried that when the Route 17 project was first proposed, that the, the plans for the highway were getting very close to a significant site in Castle Gardens. And so they alerted the New York State archaeologist, Dr. Robert Funk. And he came in 1965 to do an excavation of Castle Gardens because he, he saw the amateur's collections and he saw these vestal points or these notched points. And he said, this is the first time, this 1965, that we have seen a point of this style. And when you discover a new projectile point style, you get to name it. And so because Castle Gardens is in vestal, uh, Dr. Funk named the point, the Vestal corner notch point. So here we have another example of, a, of an, a point style and a site from our southern tier here that then became elevated to a level that all archaeologists in New York State and in the northeastern United States know and recognize as the what they call the type site for, for Vestal. And so a whole phase was determined based on the Vestal uh, Castle Garden site. However, the dating for the site was not very clear. People have always believed that Lamoca points, those small narrow points, dated much, they were much older than Vestal by at least 500 years. Lamocas are supposed to date around 2500 BC, while Vestal points, Dr. Funk thought, based on this one site here in this uh, photograph, he thought they dated more around 1900 uh, BC. And when we found those two dates from the Robertson site at 1900 BC, he felt that that kind of confirmed his, his suspicion that that's how Vestal dated and that Lamoca was, was older. So the, the New York State Museum excavations, they created the site plan here, it's like a bird's eye view looking down on what was excavated. And these large areas are, are pits, either uh, mostly hearth features, some were storage pits. And from these excavations by the New York State Museum, he found a large number of, of vestal points and an equally large number 
of, of Lamoka. So it's, he, he was still a bit confounded about how these two points related to each other and how, what they represented in terms of people and communities. So in 2003, Binghamton University's uh, Public Archaeology Facility and Department of Anthropology launched another excavation at Castle Gardens. Um, this was part of an undergraduate field school that budding archaeologists are required to take as a, the first stepping stone to becoming a professional archaeologist. But they were also joined by members of our community archaeology program. And I don't know if any <clears throat> members of the program are uh, watching today, but they'll certainly recognize the site. The members of the Binghamton University Field School and CAT program, they excavated and screened the soil from over 60 units that measured one meter by one meter. And that's what you see here is a one meter by one meter excavation unit. And sometimes they link them up and did multiples in a row. That helped us see the stratigraphy of the site much better. <coughs> Excuse me. Here, it's almost like I'm hoping everybody can see, it's like a layer cake with this top zone of dark soil. Archaeologists refer to that as the plow zone, uh, a layer of soil where uh, things get mixed a little bit from plowing. And below it is a lighter, a tan soil. And that is a subsoil that we believe accumulated during episodes of flooding. Underneath that is a very dark, thick, layer of soil that has a lot of fire cracked rock within it, but also a lot of artifacts and other features, <coughs> excuse me. And then below that, we, we found the, the, the bottom of the excavation, no more artifacts occurred pretty much uh, underneath that dark layer. The Castle Gardens excavations produced a very diverse assemblage of artifacts, including over 200 projectile points and fragments. These are just a, a sample of what the Binghamton excavations found. However, there were much more, many more Vestal points than there were Lamoka points. But what was intriguing is that archaeologists found Lamokas and Vestals from the exact same depth of excavations. And in one case, from the same hearth feature. And the site produced over 70 of these darkened soil features that were either hearths or part of that blackened soil that we sometimes called a, a dense midden. These radiocarbon dates were, were derived from that black midden as well as the pit that produced both the Vestal and Lamoca points. And you can see the date range below. In no way is it 1900 BC. And in fact, the date range more closely matches the accepted date for Lamoca. So while these have classic Lamoca age ranges, they, they also had Vestal points. So the answer to one of our research questions is that there is no vertical separation of Lamoca and Vestal at Castle Gardens, which is the type site. So that raised a whole lot of, of other questions. If they're not dating to different time periods, what does it mean to have two different styles of projectile points on the same site? Were, were these, and these are questions we've asked ourselves and we continue to ask ourselves, were they different communities that just for, for based on tradition made different styles of points? Or is it possible that one community would make a different style of points for different tasks? Are some of these hunting and some of these used for spearfishing? We actually had some um, edge residue analysis done on a sample, a small sample of the points, <coughs> which suggested that maybe the small vestal points, because they were notched and they had those tangs on the sides, maybe they were better for fishing because the tangs would have held the, the, the wiggling fishies onto that spear. Uh, some of the edge 
residue from those vestal points did suggest it had oily residue from, from fishing. Others, like the, the narrow Lamoca points, suggest that there might have been uh, more blood residue embedded in them that could have been from hunting. But it was not very clear cut. There, there was some crossover. There was some fishing residue on the Lamoca points and some blood residue on the, on the vestals. So that's still out there for, for consideration. But maybe people lived in separate territories and had different ways of life. For instance, people whose traditions had them fishing with spears and versus people who hunted with spears. And maybe the groups visited each other, traded and arranged alliances. Maybe the Castle Garden site was one of these aggregation areas where people came together at certain times of the year and traded. At one time, we, we even wondered, because it's at a narrow point in the Susquehanna River, if they had fish weirs here. Fish weirs are uh, wooden and stone structures placed in a river and fish you know, sometimes would swim into them and get trapped into these pens. And so it's more like having fresh fish whenever you'd like to just go out there and grab them or spear them. But we know for one thing for sure is that life was a lot more complex than what the term hunter-gatherer implies. Uh, these were people no different in some ways than uh, us today, where we think about economics and where we're going to get some things we don't have for ourselves, you know, who we're going to, to marry and meet and be friends with, who, who we're going to be political partners with. Uh, life was very similar based on what we supposed to have happened uh, during these thousands of years old late archaic sites. So we continue to research castle gardens and continue asking questions and see where, to, where new technology takes us and where those answers might come from and what they might need. So now I'd like to turn to the, the woodland period. And as you'll see here, the woodland period has a, a long range, but not much is known about the woodland period until the late woodland, which starts around 900 AD. What we do know that there's a sharp contrast to the seasonally nomadic archaic communities Woodland people lived a, a much more settled lifestyle based on agriculture. Uh, they created new technologies such as pottery, which revolutionized the, the whole cooking technology. And they created the bow and arrow. And we have these triangular points that are diagnostic to the late woodland that we believe were part of the bow and arrow technology. A new social structure also emerged based on matrilineal descent and matrilocal settlement. Now matrilineal means that you belonged to the lineage of your mother. So for instance, uh, when a child was born today, they would receive the last name of their mother rather than their father. Matrilocal means that upon marriages, uh, men lived in the community or even within the same longhouse as their wife's family. So sometimes, they would have to pick up, if they were Seneca, they'd have to pick up from Western New York and then move to say Onondaga, if that's where their wife resided. How do we know some of this information? Well, we, we know that from archeology, span but we also know it from oral history when indigenous peoples share that with us. And there are also some historic records by missionaries and diplomats written um, at the time of contact that helped give us a glimpse into what, what life was like then. These are just some examples here of what a, a longhouse would look like. Many times containing multiple families, sometimes with a stockade fence around it for, for protection. Uh, corn, beans, and squash were planted in mounds instead of the rows today. And this is an example of the triangular points that probably were the tips of arrows and some of the pottery type that was present in the late woodland. The first woodland, late woodland site I'll discuss is a round top site in Endicott. This is located where the grip 
Griffin ice skating rink used to be. It's not on the top of Round Top Hill where the park is today. And the first published reference to Round Top was made by Arthur C. Parker. He was a member of the Seneca Nation, uh, but he was an archeologist who worked at the New York State Museum and then became director of the Rochester Museum. And in 1920, he compiled an inventory of all sites that he could find within all counties of New York State, including Broome County. Based, he based this inventory on the collections of farmers and artifact collectors. Um, while artifacts are interesting to look at, uh, they don't tell the whole story of the site. So at the time, he did not recognize the, the importance of Round Top. It was not until the 1960s that the significance of the site became clear. Again, collectors notified the New York State Museum and the New York State archaeologist at the time, William Ritchie. And then in the 1960s, they, um, they launched an expedition out of the New York State Museum to Round Top, bringing a, a whole slew of archaeologists from the museum into our community to, to excavate the site. Now, this is not Round Top. I, Dr. Ritchie has very few photographs of himself uh, because he was the one taking most of the photographs. But I found this one uh, and just wanted to give you an idea of what, what the, the state archaeologists looked like. And this here is Dr. William Light, the first archaeologist faculty member hired at Binghamton University, then Harper College, and then later SUNY Binghamton. They, uh, the, the SUNY Binghamton Field School again piggybacked on the New York State Museum's excavations and came in 1965 and 1966 to excavate outside areas that were, were done by the New York State Museum. Together, they put together this excavation map uh, that was published in William Ritchie's volume from 1971. Here you will see all of these represent pits or hearth features, but what was really intriguing that they uncovered hundreds of post molds. And post molds are when a, a, piece, a, a piece of wood, a post, was stuck in the ground to form a longhouse or another structure. And the, the post eventually through time decayed and rotted. So it, long after they abandoned the village, what was left were these black stains in the ground that eventually became covered with flood silts and not until archaeologists uncovered them did they become visible once again. And you can see here that these hundreds of post molds formed, this gets a little messy in here, but formed a longhouse. In addition to the longhouse, there were just multiples of these pit features and hearths. Some of the hearths were inside the longhouse. Of particular importance to Round Top was the discovery of this stratified storage pit. And it's number 35 over here. And, and its location will become important in a couple seconds. But this, this feature, this pit, contained layers of botanical remains, layers of, of maize, beans, and squash that were left in the ground, they became carbonized and preserved. But they uh, were, were like the first time that in New York State that the triad, the, the three important sustainers of life, maize, beans, and squash were found together in the same pit. So that pit was over here. And at the time, the technology for radiometric dating would not allow the dating of such small items as corn kernels or seeds or beans without destroying them completely. You needed a large sample. So instead, Richie went over to pit number 30 over here, which had abundant charcoal, and he sent the charcoal from this pit away for radiocarbon dating. And this is the date that resulted from, from that, that radiocarbon dating. This made 
the Round Top site, the first site in the Northeastern United States with the earliest evidence of maize, beans, and squash uh, agriculture in the late woodland. So for many decades, Round Top was often noted as the oldest site for indigenous agriculture. Well, this claim to be the oldest, you know, lasted for decades, but in more recent times, it, it's spurred this, this debate, the maize, beans, and squash debate. And this is a, a picture that Ernest Smith, a, a Seneca artist, did for the Rochester Museum as part of the 1930s WPA uh, projects for recording uh, Native American lifeways. And they, some researchers began to question, was, was this really the earliest evidence of maize, beans, and squash? Could the charcoal from one pit really be used to date the cultigens that were in a pit that was far farther away from them? So Dr. John Hart from the New York State Museum decided that with new radiocarbon technology called AMS dating, he'd be able to directly date the cultigens from the site. And that is what he did. He took the maize dated to and submitted it, also beans and squash. And the date returned was, was AD 1225. So about you know, a little less than 200 years more recent. So Round Top's reputation as the earliest site with maize, beans, and squash agriculture no longer held water. And in fact, in more recent years, sites in the Finger Lakes that had pottery with charred remains still adhering to the inside were scraped and that charred material was sent away and determined to be maize and the dates are as early as, as AD 650. But Round Top was still the first site in the Northeast with, a, with longhouse remains as well as all three cultigens, the first time that that, that was found in, in, the, in the Northeast. So now I'll turn to the Castle Creek site. The Castle Creek site uh, is on land that now house, houses the Weiss Markets on Upper Front Street. It's a really fantastic and interesting site. And thanks to the Broome County Historical Society for, for allowing me to use these photographs and for Shannon Lindridge who, who actually scanned them for me so I could use them in this talk. Um, again, Arthur C. Parker, first noted this site existed, and he cited the historian J.H. French in his publication in 1960, which noted the creek's name derived from an Indian castle at its mouth. But again, this reference does not acknowledge the significance that this site was soon to be producing a, a information that would be a, a great contribution to our current knowledge. In the 1930s, Foster Dysinger, a founding member of the Broome County Historical Society, he sponsored out of his own pocket an expedition to the site by hiring two graduate students from Harvard University. Uh, Carl Schmidt here is one of the, the graduate students um, and the young man, John Timoshek, I think is a, a local young man who participated in the excavations along with others. But William Ritchie also heard about the site and he, he uh, got involved with some excavations as well. Now the excavations here is from, in comparison to what you've seen in other slides are not, not quite what we do at, in modern archeology, span um, but they did make an exciting discovery. They found the outline of a palisade wall. And a palisade is made up of larger wooden posts, larger than what you would use for a longhouse. And they, they are protective fencing. They, they were stuck, sometimes they were seven or eight feet tall, if not higher. And they protected the village, but also provided newcomers traveling down the rivers with evidence that we, we own this land. Here's, our, here's our, the outline of our community. So it gave people some advance warning that they were, they were moving through lands that were already occupied by, by other communities. The site 
also had really amazing preservation, preservation that I have not seen in, in, on any other site that in, the, in New York State and probably in the Northeastern United States. You know, here is an example, a fragment of a woven twined bag. You just don't, you don't see this anymore. Uh, down here is a, a trot line made of Indian hemp fiber. And the trot line had fish hooks, complex ones made of hawthorns. It is absolutely incredible that these survived through time and in our acidic soil. So it must mean that there was a, <clears throat> some special conditions up on Round uh, Castle Creek Hill that helped preserve these items. I believe Robertson has these and, and some might be in, in the exhibition uh, upstairs. But Foster Dysinger was also a very talented illustrator. And so he tried to reconstruct, you know, based on the, the tangled remains from pit excavations, he tried to reconstruct what these might have looked like and, and did a really good job of showing how the fibers were twined into these, these ropes and small lines. And also the fish hooks with how they, they were put together and held together. Castle Creek also had an incredible amount of pottery and some of them were whole pots or smashed whole pots that could be reconstructed. Uh, the, these are examples, just some examples of the many types of clay pots, decorated pots that were found. And you have to keep in mind that uh, this site was pretty much untouched in the 1930s and, and did not suffer you know, decades and decades of deep farming that would have disturbed some of the pits that these, these pots were in. But William Ritchie later noticed that these, some of the decorations on these pipes were much different than what he had seen on other sites. So he defined a type of pottery called the Castle Creek type. And the site was so significant that he defined a whole, whole phase of the late woodland called the Castle Creek phase. Which, which had you know, wide ranging significance in New York State and beyond and was cited many times in publications. Castle Creek was not without its own debates. Um, Foster Dysinger, using the, the excavation data that was derived from the site, put together a diorama of what life might have looked like on, on top of the hill that housed Castle Creek. And if you notice there that there are, whoops, there are huts similar to these that excavators and analysts at the time interpreted as being the, the, the dwelling type that existed on the Castle Creek site. Now, more recent scholars have strongly suggested that these post hole patterns be looked at again based on the, the, the records that were made on the site during excavation, because it would be extremely unusual to have a palisaded community that had huts that resembled wigwams as opposed to longhouses. So if in fact, that's what the patterns actually show then this is a very significant dimension to our understanding of life. And it's possible it could have been a fishing, a large fishing village, but they are not usually palisaded. Usually the work effort put into putting a palisade in, in indicates that it's a, it's a year round settled community. So that's one thing that needs a second look. And also Ritchie assigned a date for the Castle Creek phase to AD 1300. And what he did was average the, the two dates that you see on the screen here. So it has shades of the controversy that was at Round Top. Should we take a second look if there's carbon, un undisturbed carbon remaining and see what Castle Creek's dates actually say. Maybe it was a multi-component site with two communities separated by a couple hundred years, or maybe not. So a reanalysis is, is definitely needed. Whether or not we can do that, uh, we'd have to find out if some of the carbonized remains 
had been preserved, uh, you know, with good intentions, preserved with some kind of uh, chemical that make them no longer eligible for radiometric dating. A lot of the collection is stored at the Robertson Museum and some is at the Rochester Museum. So it's out there and maybe some of the pots have carbonized residue adhering to them that can be scraped away and uh, submitted for, for dating. And finally, I'll be talking about the Binghamton University Downtown Academic Center and across the street, the Twin River Commons uh, housing complex. So here, the academic center is already built. And, and those of you from the area know where it is. Uh, those of you who are not from the area, you might recognize the arena across the street. And, and this was excavated by Binghamton University. And the Twin River Commons was a private development, how, student housing development that was right at the confluence. So we were very surprised when we peeled back the asphalt parking lots on both of those parcels to discover sections of uh, large sections of undisturbed soil, both at the, the uh, academic center here, as well as Twin River Commons, there were historic foundations some of them dating to the earliest beginnings of the city of Binghamton. But just like your houses today, you have backyards and some of you may have gardens in your backyards. So there was undisturbed soil in between foundations as well as in the yard areas behind these structures. So for instance, in, in the, the Binghamton Academic Center, we were actually able to identify Sorry, the outline of a sensitive computer of a longhouse, as well as over 60 pit features and cooking hearths, some of them within the walls of the longhouse, some of them on the outside. We also had abundant collections of of decorated pottery that dated up to AD 1400. So the site was incredibly productive in terms of the late woodland. And we were able to get an enormous artifact assortment from that. Many of the artifacts are on display in the, in the downtown academic center on the main floor. And I think anybody who wants to take a look at them is welcome to visit. <clears throat> In addition, as I mentioned, there were numerous pit features. These are storage pits. And just as with post mold, when you put organic, <clears throat> excuse me, organic refuse garbage into a pit and you leave it alone, it somewhat composts on its own and turns this dark soil. Sometimes when you cut these pits in half, you can see a stratified layer of how they were used during different times for throwing out different types of, of refuse. <coughs> Excuse me. And these can be radiocarbon dated and we did date many of them and they date within the range at the academic center to AD 900 to 1400. The pottery produced has styles that from some of the earliest pottery, AD 900 to 1200 with very flat uh, lips and others were highly decorated with cord markings. Now the pottery decoration techniques during these earlier periods, they used knotted twine, again Indian hemp, knotted and wrapped around either a, a stick or a paddle or even a, the end of a piece of bone. And that design with the knotted twine would be pressed into the wet clay before firing. Across the street at Twin River Commons, there was a much different type of pottery. There was also corded pottery, but for the first time we begin to see incised lines in the decorations for the pottery. These incised designs may have been made with a wooden or bone stylus that you know, dragged through the wet clay 
this type of pottery, this incised pottery, usually dates to about 1520 to 1590, right before uh, the arrival of Europeans. And in fact, we had radiocarbon dates from Twin River Common site that date to that range. And one of the interesting pits that was found at Twin River Commons was a, sh a shell pit. It's a regular pit feature, but, but instead it has some shell on the top. And that shell leaked into the al you know, alkaline materials leached into the, into the pit and preserved bone tools. And one of the tools preserved was a bone awl that had a, a polished tip that we believe could have been one of the styluses that was used to decorate the incised pottery. So I mentioned in the introduction that I, I work in consultation and collaboration with indigenous peoples, uh, mostly from the Onondaga, Oneida, and the Lenni Lenape nations. So th these are two examples of success stories for, for uh, productive consultations that were respectful and produced a lasting impression and record of the peoples who once lived at these sites. So for the Binghamton Academic Center, we, we uh, contracted with Tony Gagne, who's a faith keeper for the Onondaga Nation, and Tom Huff, who is a sculptor. And they created, designed and created this stone sculpture that sits within the Binghamton Academic Center. And anybody can go take a look. It's on, up on the third floor right now. And it de depicts Sky Woman with a, a child, an infant, signifying her as the, the mother of the indigenous people. Who, who came and lived on the expanding turtle's back, especially also here at the confluence. On the back in relief is a depiction of maize, beans, and squash, the sustainers of life. And so Tony and Tom titled this sculpture, The Givers of Life. And it was meant as the, the final chapter of the excavation of the site, but a commemoration that will stand there forever to remind us of the people and their ancestors who lived here hundreds and thousands of years ago. For Twin River Commons, the developers for that project worked very closely with the Onondaga Nation. And at the end, at the ribbon cutting for, for the, uh, the, the housing project, they had a ceremony with Wendy Gagne, who was a clan mother of of the Onondaga Nation Beaver Clan and her brother, Tony Gagne, who is the, uh, the faith keeper for the Onondaga Nation, one of the faith keepers. And they presented uh, the representative of developers and Newman development with a, a lacrosse stick. And they presented me with a, a, a basket that uh, I keep today in, in a clear sight in my home. So uh, this is a, a good example of, of how a respectful development can can occur uh, if everyone's willing to to uh, preserve areas of importance and, and move things around a little bit and also to provide a way to commemorate the people who were here before us. So that's the end of my talk. I, I do want to acknowledge the Haudenosaunee nations and their representatives who who very generously share their knowledge with with me and with others. Uh, the Robertson Museum, Natalie Shoemaker, for inviting me to, to talk today, and Shannon Lindrich, who, who spent a lot of time going over the photographs with me for Castle Creek and making uh, scans of them. Uh, the Broome County Historical Society for allowing me to use the materials from Castle Creek. The Public Archaeology Facility, my former place of, of employment, uh, that generously allows me to use the, the materials from the downtown sites and the New York State Museum for their several generations of, of work uh, on, on the sites in our region, helping to elevate the sites in our region to an area, a, a level of national importance. So thank you very much. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Nina. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to take a quick moment to pause just in case anybody has any questions in the chat. Um, and if not, then we can conclude. <laughs> oh, I'm upside down. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. All right. I guess we have a quiet chat, just people who want to listen, maybe. There's four people, I think. There's there's nine people right now. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. If you don't have any questions, um, we'll be sending out the recording um, for this talk to, to everyone in case you want to review it. Um, thank you again, Nina, for, for providing all your wonderful knowledge. Um, I learned a, a whole lot <laughs> about the different excavation sites, so I appreciate it. All right, then we'll say goodbye. Oh, uh, oh. Alessandro says, grazie, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you everyone for listening. And we hope to be back again with more presentations like these in the future. And Jessica oh, says, you. thank you. Becky says, thank you. We learned a lot. Lots of thank yous to you, Nina. I know some of the people. Oh, good, Our wonderful. community program. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. All right, then we'll thank you all for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you again in the future. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.